Praise the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word. And thank you for your love for everyone. We're asking, oh Lord, whatever has clouded our vision, whatever has chilled our hearts, and whatever may be the blockage between us and pure faith, perfect faith, penetrating faith, persevering faith, we pray you clear everything out of the way in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, the way and the path to have real prayer of faith and for the prayer of your people to be answered every time for mountains to move away from every life. Lord, I pray you open the way for everyone in Jesus' name. Reveal your mind to everyone and make all your servants, all your ministers, all workers to be fruitful, progressive, and successful in your work and in the work of their hand in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. Tonight we're looking at James chapter 5. And we're looking at verses 13 to 20. I want to read from verse 13. And I want you to underline the word pray. In verse 13, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Look at verse 14. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him. Again, the word pray. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15. And the prayer of faith, that's the word again, the prayer. The prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. If he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Verse 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray. That's the word again. Pray one for another that she may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer, that's the word, of a righteous man avails much. Verse 17. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly. That's the word again. He prayed earnestly that it might not train. And he trained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Verse 18. And he prayed again. That's the word again. He prayed again. And the heaven gave rain. And the earth brought forth a fruit. You will see in all those verses, each of the verses has the word pray or prayed or prayer which makes it very important that we understand that prayer is very essential indispensable central pivotal in the life of the believer a member of the church in the life of the worker a minister in the life of the preachers the pastors the people who are leading us Tonight, we're looking at the message, the irresistible power of the prayer of faith. The irresistible power of the prayer of faith. We're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, the powerful prayer of faith. Number two, the prevailing prayer of the faithful. Number three, the persevering prayer for the fallen. Let's come to number one. In number one, we have the powerful prayer of faith. We're coming back to James chapter 5, verse 13. 
Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Have you noticed there? Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Maybe many people will say, that's what I've been doing. But my prayer has not been effective. I've not had any answer to my prayer. Let's read it again. Is any among you afflicted? It doesn't say, let him worry. Many people worry before they pray. And after their prayer, they keep on worrying. That's not the prayer of faith. Is any of you afflicted? It doesn't say, let him fret. There are people, they fret and fret and fret every time. Then they pray. And then after the prayer, they keep on fretting. Is any among you afflicted? It doesn't say, let him panic. Let him fear. There are people, their hearts are full of fear. And when anything happens, an affliction, they begin to panic and they begin to fear. And then in that panic, they kneel down and they pray. While they are praying, their minds are on the affliction and they are panicking and they are fearful. And then they still pray, but the prayer is surrounded and the prayer is pregnant with panicking. And then after the prayer, they're still panicking. I don't know what will happen next. I don't know what I'm going to do. That's why we're not praying the prayer of faith. Is any among you afflicted? Let him suspect people. Let him criticize people. This affliction, uh, the way that person is, the way that person is, the way that person is, it's like I'm suspecting the affliction is coming from them. And actually when they are praying, they are not praying to have the affliction resolved. They are praying to conquer and they are praying to defeat and to destroy. The one they suspect is causing the affliction. It says, leave all that aside. If you're going to pray and your prayer is going to be effective and the prayer is going to be answered, no fear, no panic, no fretting, no worry, no anxiety, and there is no suspicion, and there is no gossip, and there is no disobedience, and there is no pulling away, avoiding this, avoiding that. And then we say we're praying. It says, is any among you afflicted? The first thing to do is to remember that God is your God and God is your Father and that God has given you a promise. On the basis of that promise, you go to God in prayer, let him pray, really pray. And when he prays, he should remember the prayer of command, the prayer that solicits the help of God and the prayer of partnership with God and the prayer of assurance that if I pray in the name of Jesus, this is what will happen. Let him pray assuredly like that and God will answer your prayer. Is any Mary, it doesn't say let him throw a party. No, don't follow the world. Is any Mary, let him squander money. It doesn't say that. Is any Mary, let him publicize himself everywhere. I got this, I gained this, I have this, I possess this. Everybody come and see and expose himself to the world. Is any Mary, even at such a time, let your moderation be known unto all men. Let him sing psalms, songs of praises unto the Lord. That's why when you pray that prayer, the way the uh, apostle has written for us, your prayer will be answered. Miracle will come from heaven. Amen. Amen. Three things we're looking at here under the powerful prayer of faith. Number one, the pertinent command. 
the command that is still effective today that the lord is still giving out today the pertinent command for suffering saints this is sage this is a child of god this is a brother this is a sister is one of the brethren she's suffering he's suffering affliction or persecution the pertinent command for suffering saints number two the prescribed condition for sick sufferers if the suffering is a sickness there is a condition and he has given us the condition number three the promise cure for sincere seekers let's look at number one in number one the pertinent command for suffering says james chapter 5 verse 13 5 13 is any among you afflicted let him pray look at that question is any among you afflicted it doesn't give the impression that everybody in the church will be under affliction it doesn't give uh, the the impression that every believer every member every member of the family of god must be sick and must be afflicted that everybody must go through that no it may so happen that somebody out of the thousands of people millions of people is any among you afflicted well there's something you should do that he must do let him pray is any mary let him sing psalms that's the command and that command is still there today in psalm 50 verse 15 psalm 50 verse 15 call upon me in the day of trouble affliction comes in various ways troubles come in various ways and whatever the shape and whatever the size of that trouble of that trial of that affliction call upon me in the day of trouble i will deliver thee i thought you'll say amen and thou shalt glorify me i will deliver thee and thou shalt what will you do glorify me you know what i've discovered i've discovered that when people who have not been christians and they just came and the lord rules their problems away they give testimonies they glorify the lord i've discovered that church people when good things happen to them they say i don't think i want to glorify god i don't want to speak in the public because i don't know who is there who is not there and if i give my testimony i don't know what may happen they think there is somebody who is powerful enough to reverse what God has done. And because of that, God has delivered them. God has answered their prayers. Again, they are fearful that if they gave their testimonies, they don't know what will happen. That sickness may return. When God says yes, nobody can say no. Nobody can reverse the blessing of God in your life. When you glorify God, more good things will happen in your life. That's the command of God. Call upon me in the day of trouble. Look at Jeremiah chapter 33. And we're looking at verse 3. Jeremiah 33 verse 3. Call unto me. It's a command that he has given us. And that command is still relevant today. And that command is still given to everyone today. That command is still for anyone having affliction, anyone having trouble, anyone having problem, anyone having a challenge. And the Lord said directly, call unto me. And then he tells us what he will do. And I will answer thee. Tonight, he will answer you. Every time you come to God and you are faithful to the word of God and then you say, Lord, this is what you have said. Is sending among you afflicted. Let him pray. I come to you on the basis of what you have said, on the basis of what you have commanded. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. God will show you. 
God will reveal to you. And he will reveal a mighty answer, a great answer to every one of us in Jesus' name. We're coming back to James chapter 5 verse 14. In James chapter 5 verse 14, it says, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. It doesn't say, let him evaluate those elders, position those elders, judge those elders, and say, can I go to him? That's the commandment of God. It says, is any sick among you? Again, it's not saying everybody will be sick. It doesn't say this is the portion that God gives to everybody one time or the other. And this is a blessing in disguise that if you are sick, maybe it's the will of God. Maybe God gave you that. Maybe God is uh, trying to give you a blessing in disguise. If it's a blessing in disguise, what will he tell us to go and see pastors or preachers or elders to take the blessing away from us? If it is the will of God that you are sick, what will he send you to the ministers and say, that is my will, but go to that minister and go to that pastor and let him remove my will away from you? No! Sickness is not the will of God for you. And sickness is not the gift of God for you. Is any sick among you? You should not be sick normally, but should it happen? Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. And no story, no criticism, no complaint, no murmuring pastors i don't know why it's like this like this at this time i don't understand the other time this happened the other time this happened it's it doesn't say go to the elders and complain go to the elders and murmur go to the elders and criticize the church go to the elders and fish out who is doing this and that in the church just call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The oil, the name. The oil represents the Holy Ghost. And when you're full of the Holy Ghost, and then you lay hands on the seed, whether you have literal oil or not, you know that the Holy Ghost is present here. And it says, in the name of the Lord, everything you ask in the name of the Lord, the Lord will answer in Jesus' name. Look at number two here. Number two is uh, telling us about the prescribed condition for sick sufferers. When somebody is sick, what's the condition? As he's going to pray by himself, or the pastors are going to pray for him, or as the leader is going to pray for him, the prescribed condition for sick sufferers. Look at James chapter 5, verse 15. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he has committed sins, look at that, sins weaken the prayer of faith. If he has committed sins, it shall be forgiven him. He must recognize, you examine yourself. Why has this happened? Have you been gossiping of late? Have you been disobeying God of late? Have you not been discerning the Lord's body of late? Have you been fighting against the word of God of late? Have you done something secret of late that God is saying is waking you up? You are not listening to the word of God. And because of that, you must have the rod of God. And it's laying the rod on you because of that sin. Here is the condition that you examine yourself and you find out if there is sin there or not look at verse 16 it says confess your faults one to another and pray one for another confess if you have seen any fault 
you have seen any transgression you've discovered any iniquity here is a condition that you will confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that she may be healed the effectual having prayer of a righteous man the man who has discovered sin who has confessed age, who has turned away from age, who has been cleansed from age, he becomes a righteous man. And the effectual of fervent prayer of a righteous man, the man who has seen, I was faulty there. Here is my fault. Here is my fault. And he confessed that fault to God and to the one he has offended. And the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed him. And the Lord has forgiven him and set him free. And he becomes a righteous man. He's justified now in the presence of God. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much remember the one who was sick has gone to the elders of the church or maybe one elder of the church and that elder of the church himself that preacher himself that pastor himself that person that is going to pray for this other person he discovers something in his own life there is no unity between him and his wife and that lack of unity between him and the wife breaks the unity between him and the bridegroom the picture of his own family husband and wife is translated to be the picture between him and the bridegroom and once the unity there is broken and once there is some forgiveness within him towards the wife or towards the husband or towards any member of the church that one also breaks the line of communication between him and the bridegroom and somebody is coming and he's asking for prayer and the person who is to pray he realizes ah my heart is not right with members of the church my heart is not right with fellow ministers my heart is not right with my family members and he sets that right when he sets that right god forgives him and god cleanses him he becomes a righteous man because God forgives and forgets all that he has done wrong. And that communication is mended between him and the bridegroom and the head of the church. And he becomes a righteous man. And when he now prays, the prayer is effective. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. There are conditions here. Look at Genesis chapter 20. In Genesis chapter 20, we're reading from verse 7. Now, therefore, restore the man, his wife. Abimelech had taken the wife of Abraham. And now there was a sickness in the family, barrenness in the family. And now impotence has come into the family. Powerlessness has come into the family. And there's no other person to help him out of that problem except the Abraham they are taking his wife and God will not communicate the healing to him directly God will not communicate the uh, potency to the family directly and God will not communicate the fruit bearing to him directly God must go through his servant his prophet and yet Abimelech had taken the wife of Abraham a precious thing from Abraham and when the promise of God centers for Abraham that he will have the promised son that center and that nucleus of the promise of God of the provision of God for the prophet for Abraham Abimelech had taken and then God said you can be healed I know you are ignorant. You didn't know what you are doing. Here is what you'll do. Here is the prescribed condition for the sick sufferer. It says, therefore, restore the man, his wife. It may not be his wife that you have taken. You have taken his honor. You have taken his position. You have taken away his good name. You have rubbished his good name. 
And then you are praying and praying. And the Lord reminds you when you bring your gifts to the altar. And there you remember your brother, your sister, your wife, your husband, your neighbor, your fellow member has ought against you. Leave that prayer, leave that gift, and go back to him and reconcile with your brother, with your wife, with your husband, with the member of the church. It says, when you do that resurrection, then come back and offer thy gift. Now, therefore, restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet. That's what God said. People may not recognize Abraham as a prophet. God said, the man is a prophet. Abimelech might not have known him as a prophet, but God said, he is a prophet. Even Sarah, the wife, may not recognize that man as a prophet. God said, he is a prophet. And people around him and the neighbors may not recognize him as a prophet. He is a prophet. And he shall pray for thee. And thou shalt live if thou restore her not. And you think you'll solve the problem by fasting. And yet you'll not restore her. You think you'll solve the problem by doing good and giving money to this. And giving uh, things to that. If thou restore her not. You might go around parambulating and doing other things. You give him sheep, you give him goats, you give him property, you give him land, and restore her not. You know, if you give Abraham land, land is not going to produce the promised son Isaac. And then God wants Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, until we come to Jesus. And if you give him land, if you give him house, if you give him money, give him anything, and you don't restore that wife, Sarah, the promise of God for him and the promise of God for the whole world will be truncated. So if thou restore her not, know that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Well, the only one now barren, but now it will go from barrenness to a worse situation if you don't restore her. And then we're told in verse 14, in verse 14, and Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham. Abimelech, that's good, that's kind, that's generous, but you have not done it yet. You see, there are people that will substitute required obedience with what they think about. Okay, I'll do this. Maybe that's all right. But if you have not done what God requires, you are not there yet. And they were told, and restored him, Sarah, his wife. That's it. And restored him, Sarah, his wife. That's the condition. And uh, you know, there are people, they are the major on restitution. And they think they are talking to other people. Restore his wife, restore his wife. If you are second wife, if you are third wife, they don't check up in their own lives. What are they taking away from the man that God calls a prophet? What are they taking away from the man that God calls his servant what are they taking away from the man that god calls his friend they're not thinking about that they're only talking to other people you know if you are second wife if you are third wife make restitution and they themselves do not understand uh, there are things they need to check up in their lives if they're going to pray the prayer of faith and the prayer that god will answer they need to restore the dignity of the man, the dignity of taking away, the honor you have taken away, and the right that you have taken away. In the world, the human rights um, organizations will fight for people when you have taken their rights away. But in the church, you know, they take the right of this one, the right of that one, and we pray and pray and pray, and it's like we're hitting a block wall. And the Lord is saying, no NGO will fight for that person. You are taking his right away. But I am 
God, the God of justice. And then he says, do that and everything will be all right. I said everything will be all right. Look at verse 17 there. In verse 17, so Abraham prayed unto God and God healed Abimelech and his wife. Abimelech fulfilled the condition. And now Abraham was happy. His heart got settled. What was the condition of his heart when his wife was taken away from him? He must have been thinking of quite a lot of things. God said, by this woman, I'll give you laughter, I'll give you joy, I'll give you a son. Now the woman is taken away. And this is a pagan uh, king. What am I going to do now? But then he restored the wife and his heart was settled. He was happy in that happy condition, in that settled condition. He could pray. You know, when your heart is in turmoil, how can you pray well? When your heart is uh, kind of uh, sorrowful because of what you have lost, how can you pray well? But because it was restored unto him, he prayed. And he prayed with joy and happiness. And he prayed with assurance. And Abraham prayed unto God. And God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maid servant. And they all bear children. We're coming to Job chapter 22. Job chapter 22. We're looking at verse 23. Receive, I pray thee. In verse 22. Job chapter 22, verse 22. Receive, I pray thee the law from his mouth. And lay up his word in thine heart. That's the condition. You receive the word of God. You receive the commandments of God. You receive the instruction from God. And this is what he says. Make right your life. Clean up your life. Live a righteous life. Have more of the grace of God in you. And be obedient to the word he has commanded. And you lay all that word in your heart. Then in verse 23, it tells us, if thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. That's the condition. Now look at verse 27. See what will follow. And thou shalt make thy prayer unto him, and he shall hear thee. And thou shalt pay thy vows. All the commitment you made to the Lord, consecration you made to the Lord, in the days of affliction, in the days of sickness, in the days of trouble, Lord, if you deliver me from this, I'll serve you more, I'll give myself more I'll not count any cost, any price too great I'm going to serve you I, You pay your vows And then in verse 28 It says, thou shalt also decree a sin And it shall be established unto thee But remember, you put iniquity far away from you And then you decree a sin And it shall be established unto thee And thy light shall shine The light shall shine upon thy ways amen Isaiah chapter 58 we're reading from verse 8 Isaiah chapter 58 verse 8 then shall thy light break forth as the morning thine health shall spring forth speedily I need a good amen there you know there are people that they're just tolerating life, managing life. They are at the edge of life. They are not really sick, but they're not really well. They're not strong. They're not agile. It appears that they're weak and sickly. And yes, they're still managing life, but life is not the way it ought to be. And the promise of God that will have the life of Christ manifested in us is not there. But you know, as you look at the conditions that God has said, it says, Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall be the real one. And then in verse 9, it tells us in verse 9, Then shall thou call, and the Lord shall answer. 
Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. Look at the condition. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the yoke, you check up your life, whether you have affliction or not, you want to get to heaven, the Lord has taken yokes away from his own people. And he has given us the promise. He says, take my yoke upon you. I remove the other yoke. And you take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my body is light. You discover, maybe people have told you or they don't have chance to tell you. But you can tell from their body language, you're pressing them. You're putting yokes upon them. And then you're having challenges and problems. And you're praying and praying. And you're seeking the face of the Lord. And the yoke, the affliction appears to be there. It says you will take the yoke away. And the putting forth of the finger. And speaking vanity. When we do that... The blessings of God will multiply in our lives in Jesus' name. Well, coming to number three now. Number three is the promised cure for sincere seekers. The promised cure for sincere seekers. It tells us in um, James chapter 5, verse 15, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. Remember all those conditions? Remember, he must confess a sin. Remember, he must turn away from the sin. Remember, he must return the prophets or the preachers or the members, things uh, that he has taken. He must uh, make his way right and he must take the yoke away from the lives of people he has put any yoke on. And then the prayer of faith shall save the seed and the Lord shall raise him up. And then he bust. 16 it says confess your first one to another and pray one for another that she may be healed it says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much in Isaiah chapter 57 verse 18 Isaiah 57 verse 18 I have seen his ways I will heal him I have seen is fulfilled the conditions, is made right what is wrong, is adjusted that life, his life is now purged and purified and made righteous. I have seen his ways, I will heal him, I will lead him also and restore comfort unto him and to his mourners. Look at Mark chapter 11, verse 22. It says in Mark 11 verse 22, And Jesus answering says unto them, Have faith in God. Verse 23, in verse 23, For verily I say unto you, That whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, And shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he says. Look at verse 24. In verse 24, therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. Any amen? Look at verse 25. In verse 25, and when ye stand praying, forgive. When ye stand praying, forgive. You're praying to God. You want this affliction to be taken away. You want that sickness to be taken away. Husband and wife, they're not in talking terms. When you stand praying, forgive. Husband and wife, one has packed out, the other one is packing out to another place when you stand praying now forgive one is bitter against the other and they're dividing the children the girls our the, the wife and the boys our the man when you stand praying now forgive and then the man is teaching the children against the wife and telling the children your mother is a witch your mother is covering my star 
when ye stand praying, forgive if he have ought against any, that your Father, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. Look at verse 26. But if he do not forgive, but you keep on praying, if he do not forgive, but you keep on fasting, if you do not forgive and you are playing games with one another, with each other, and you are shooting a secret against the other person, if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive you your trespasses. It tells us in First John chapter 3, reading from verse 20, it says, If our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Then in verse 21, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. When there's no condemnation in the heart, when there's no guilt in the heart, and when you know by the grace of God towards God, your heart is pure and towards the closest person to you and all the members of the church, your heart is pure and cleaner and there is no cover up anywhere you're not doing evil secretly against anybody if our heart condemn us not then have we confidence toward God and then in verse 22 and whatsoever we ask we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing as well as pleasant in his sight We'll come to point number two now. In point number two, the prevailing prayer of the faithful. The prevailing prayer of the faithful. Here we come to three things. Number one, the selfless prayer of his fiery servant. The selfless prayer of his fiery servant. Number two, the self-sacrificing prayer of his faithful shepherd. Number three, the soul-seeking prayer of all fervent saints. Let's come to number one. Number one, the selfless prayer of his fiery servant. Look at James chapter 5, verse 17. Elias, that's Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Look at verse 18, and after the three years and six months, he prayed again. That's one man in the whole nation. The nation was going rotting, and the nation was into wickedness. Ahab, the king, and Jezebel, the wife, managed the, the nation for the devil and for Baal worship and for evil. And they turned the nation of Israel, a righteous nation, into an unrighteous, ungodly, abominable, godless nation. And because of that, Elijah, the man of God, he became concerned. And to turn them back to God, they had to see the hand of God. That's why he prayed. And then there was no rain for three and a half years. And now the nation was just like that. To bring them back to God, he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. You know the story? Let's refresh our mind concerning the story. First Kings chapter 17 verse 1. In First Kings chapter 17 verse 1, and Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. He had prayed, that's what we are told in James. He had prayed, and because he had prayed, he now came with authority. He came with the key, and he said, according to my word, there will be no dew nor rain. 
at the end of the three and a half years the lord told him go show yourself unto ahab and then in chapter 18 chapter 18 verse 21 he came to the people and he said how long halt ye between two opinions if god be god follow him but if Bill, then follow him and the people answered him not a word guilt stopped their mouth condemnation silenced them and their evil following after Baal and forsaking the almighty God the God of heaven their deliverer their shepherd their redeemer the God of Israel they had forsaken him that shut their mouth and eventually he gave out the condition I'm the only one remaining you have the prophets of Baal let them take a bull and let them cut in pieces and put on the altar but put no fire and let them pray unto their God and then I too I will do the same thing and the God that answers by fire let him be the God you remember the story all those prophets of Baal they prayed and prayed and prayed and nothing happened all those people who are you know worshiping another God they're not living right and they are not fulfilling the condition God has said for effective effectual prayer of faith all those uh, prophets they could do nothing for Israel and today too they will do nothing for the nation and eventually um, Elijah came and he said all right now come near people and he repaired the altar of the Lord and he prayed let's look at verse 36 in verse 36 and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening service sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said Lord God of Abraham Isaac and of Israel let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel he said that's my goal that's my purpose for praying unto you O Lord let it be known by all the Israelites by the backsliding nation that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word not because I have any private agenda personal opinion I'm doing this at your word you see that's how God answers prayer when he knows that you do everything you say everything and you operate everything at his word for his glory and for people to be turned unto the Lord and then in verse 37 he prayed and he said hear me O Lord hear me that these people may know that's my purpose that's my goal that ought to be your purpose that ought to be your goal anything you do anyhow you pray that these people may know that thou art the Lord God not Baal not idols not abominable idolatry and that thou hast turned their heart back again and they were told in verse 38 it says and then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the bond sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the doors and licked up the water that was in the trench in verse 39 were told and when all the people saw it they fell on their faces and they said the Lord he is God the only God the Redeemer the creator of the heavens and the earth the one that has all power and the one that has redeemed us he is God the Lord he is God and then in verse 41 we're told Elijah said unto Ahab get thee up and eat and drink for there is a sound of abundance of rain 42 he then tells us it says so Ahab went up to eat and to drink and Elijah went up at the top of Camel and cast himself down upon the earth and put his face between his knees. Then in verse 43, it says, And he said, And said to his servant, Go up now and look toward the sea. And he went up and he looked and said, There is nothing. But he knew the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The fervent prayer, the 
effective prayer and the faithful prayer and the word based prayer of a righteous man availeth much and he said go again seven times and in verse 44 it says and it came to pass at the seventh time that he said behold there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea and like a man's son and he said go up and say unto Ahab Prepare thy chariot and get thee down that the rain stop thee not. Verse 45 after three and a half years now that he prayed again and it came to pass in the meantime, in the meantime while the, that the heavens was black with clouds and wind and there was a great rain and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. As we pray like that, understanding that we want the nation's heart and the people in the nation to be turned unto God and we pray with all our heart, God will answer. And he will turn the nation back to himself in Jesus' name. Number two now. Number two is the self-sacrificing prayer of his faithful shepherd. Exodus chapter 32. We're reading from verse 10. The story here is that the children of Israel had gone to raise up a calf. And they were worshipping and God said he was going to reject them. Look at this, Exodus chapter 32 verse 10. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them, all of them together, and I will make of thee a great nation. Look at the intercession of the man of God, the intercession of the faithful shepherd in verse 11. It says in verse 11, And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power? And with a mighty hand. In verse 12, it says, Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of their turn, from the fierce wrath, and repent of this evil against thy people look at verse 14 in verse 14 and the lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people look at verse 32 there in verse 32 yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin and if not blot me i pray thee out of thy book which thou hast written look at the self-sacrificing prayer don't make me a great nation get the people restored and get them back and make them to know and to understand that you are their god and they are your people and that is the kind of prayer the lord wants us to pray to be concerned for the people who are away from god so that uh, the lord can uh, restore them and we're not looking at a great position a high position at the expense of the people of god you know if you are praying and your heart is on your position on your exaltation whether the people the church the members whether they get to heaven or not whether they are restored or not whether they are saved sanctified or not whether they are rapturable or not if you are just making progress and the lord is going to exalt you and give you such a high position here on earth and there in heaven you don't care for any other thing you do not have the heart of the shepherd and you cannot pray for the people for the lord to actually bring them back look at romans chapter 9 we're reading from verse 1 romans chapter 9 it tells us in verse 1 i say the truth in christ i lie not my conscience also bearing me witness in the holy ghost look at verse 2 it says at that i have 
great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. In verse 3, it says, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Paul the apostle was concerned that the children of Israel, his kinsmen, they were not giving their lives to the Lord. And he knew if they died in that condition, they would go to hell. He said, I could wish that even I myself, I know my name is in the book of life, I wish if I could be accursed for them, separated from Christ, if that will bring them to salvation, he said, that will be all right. But you know, God could not do that. Already Christ has sacrificed, and the sacrifice of Saul was not of Paul was not necessary to bring them to the Lord. But the point is, he was ready to sacrifice self so that the people can come to the Lord. Look at number three. Number three is the soul-seeking prayer of all fervent saints, all of us. We now have a heart. We're seeking the people, and we want them. We want the people of God, that those who are still in the world, they're not saved yet. We want them to hear the word of God. They are lost, and they're like sheep fainting without a shepherd. They do not know the way, the way into the kingdom. And we're praying, and we're pleading, and we're seeking, and we're preaching, and we're evangelizing, and witnessing that these will come to the Lord. We're I want to have a part of that heart of Christ and the nature also of Elijah and also that of Moses. I want to share in that body that other people too may come to know the Lord and our prayer is directed in that fashion. It tells us in Matthew chapter 9 verse 36, it says, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. You see them on our streets. You see them in your community. Maybe they go to church, a nominal church, a denominational church, a church that is not Bible based where salvation is not being taught and you're not just passing by i go to my church you go to their own church you are concerned for them and you're seeking them and you're praying for them and you're preaching unto them it tells us in verse 37 it says then said he to his disciples the harvest truly is plenteous but the laborers are few then he says in verse 38 Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. We need to cry out. We need to pray. We need to seek the face of the Lord. We need to be passionate about the prayer for the people who do not know the Lord so that they will come to know the Lord. Lamentation chapter 2. We're reading from verse 18. In Lamentation chapter 2, reading from verse 18, their heart cried unto the Lord, O wall of the daughter of Zion. Let tears run down. Let tears run down. It's a prayer that you're mourning for them, you're crying for them, you're weeping for them, you're seeking the face of the Lord for them. You're not just carrying your Bible and go out where you're going. I'm going to evangelize. I'm going to witness. I'm going to pray to those sinners. Have you cried in the secret? Have you prayed in the secret? As your heart poured out his request in the secret, it says, let tears run down like a river day and night and give thyself no rest. Let not the apple of thine eyes cease. Then in verse 19, arise, cry out in the night and in the beginning of the watches, pour out thine heart like water before the face of the Lord. Lift up thine hands toward him for the life of thy young children that faint for hunger in the top 
of every street if you look at uh, psalm 2 verse 8 verse 8 it says we should ask for the souls of the people who are perishing we should plead of the lord it says ask of me and i shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost part the uttermost part of the earth you shall receive power after that the holy ghost is come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in jerusalem and in all judea and in samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth but if the lord is going to give us the souls of the people in the uttermost part of the earth we shall pray we shall ask of the lord and he will give us the hearts of the heathen for our inheritance and for the inheritance of the lord jesus christ and even the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession that's how the early church prayed and that's how they had real evangelism and real breakthrough that their communities could testify these that have turned the world upside down they have come hither also they were able to do that because they prayed they were able to do that because they interceded. They were able to do that because they poured their heart out unto God. They were concerned. They were passionate about the sinners that were still in their sin and they had not had the salvation of the Lord. And because of that passion, they fell on their knees. They then went out and they spoke to the people and many people were turned unto the Lord. In Acts of the apostles chapter 4 we're reading from verse 24 acts of the apostles chapter 4 we're reading from verse 24 it says and when they heard that they lifted up their voice to god with one accord and said lord thou art god which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that therein is look at verse 29 in verse 29 they said now lord behold their threatenings the threatenings did not stop their evangelism they had so much burden in their heart so much fire in their heart so much desire in their heart that nothing the world could do to stop them was stop them the same thing with us when we have the concern of the people we want their salvation we know that if jesus came now many people are going to perish and they're going to languish in hell forever because of that we have fervency because of that we have passion because of that there is a drive within us that compels us to go and speak to them and bring them in that's what happened to them they said now Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. And in verse 30, it says, By stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And then in verse 31, we're told, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken when they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they speak the word the word of salvation and they spoke the word the word of grace and they spoke the word the word of the gospel the word of the good news and they spoke the word of God with boldness and of course many were then turned to the Lord look at point three now point three we're talking about the persevering prayer for the falling it tells us in james chapter 5 we're reading from verse 19 james chapter 5 reading from verse 19 brethren if any of you do err from the truth if any of you do err from the truth if any of you do err from the truth that is somebody had been a believer has been a child of god then he goes after mirage of life 
he goes after the things of the world that do not profit he goes after religion that doesn't profit he goes after the things of this world belonging to the god of this world and it's gone away from the kingdom it's gone away from the fold it's gone away from the flock if any of you do hear from the truth and one convert him we we'll see those who are backsliding and those who are falling and we're concerned and our prayer is not centered on what i want what i desire about my business, about my work, and about just general, general things. We're concerned about those who are falling and those who are backsliding. It says in verse 20, it says, let him know that he which combated the sinner. In verse 19, any of you, he was a believer. In verse 19, any of you was a child of God, but then he erred from the truth. He went away from the congregation of the righteous. He is now a sinner. Let him know. Let the soul winner, let the soul seeker, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death. If that backslider is not saved, is not restored, he will perish. He will die forever, the second day, and he will suffer in hell forever. But if somebody goes after him, and somebody is passionate, seeking after him, he will save his soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. The persevering prayer for the falling. Three things we're looking at. Number one, divine pity for falling backsliders divine pity for falling backsliders god pities those falling backsliders he doesn't want them to perish he's not willing that any backslider should perish he wants them to come to repentance and restoration he wants them to come back to the lord number two diligent plea by faithful believers were pleading with God on their behalf were pleading with them on behalf of God we stand before God and we speak for them and we speak on their behalf that God would bring them conviction and God will bring restoration unto them after pleading with God we go to them and we're pleading with them pleading on behalf of God that they will come back to God diligent plea by faithful believers number three declared promises of full boundlessness let's look at number one divine pity for falling backsliders and let's look at ezekiel chapter 18 we're reading from verse 30 ezekiel chapter 18 verse 30 therefore i will judge you O house of israel everyone according to his way says the lord god look at this repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions so iniquity shall not be your ruin the heavenly father pities backsliders who are falling and pities all the sinners too and then we're told in verse 31 it says cast away from you all your transgressions whereby ye have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit for why will ye die O house of Israel he pities the sinners he pities the backsliders he tells us in verse 32 it says for i have no pleasure in the days of him that dieth says the lord god wherefore turn yourselves and live ye look at second peter chapter 3 we're looking at verse 9 it says the lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but his long suffering towards what not willing that any any sinner any backslider, any false prophet, any evil person, any transgressor, not willing that any should perish, but that all, all sinners, all backsliders, all shall come to repentance. Let's look at number two here. Number two, a diligent plea by faithful believers. Diligent plea 
by faithful believers in um, Isaiah chapter 43 verse 25 Isaiah chapter 43 verse 25 I even I I am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. He says he's ready to forgive. He will blot out. He will wipe out. He will apply the blood of the Lamb. And he will cleanse. He will forgive. He will set free. And their sin will not be remembered against them anymore. But look at verse 26. Something important to be done. Put me in remembrance. And let us plead together. Put me in remembrance and let us plead together. Declare thou that thou mayest be justified. Declare thou that thou mayest be justified. And so when we see backsliders, when we know backsliders, we pray, we plead with the Lord. And then we go to them to bring them back to their salvation and back to all the provision of the Lord. In Galatians chapter 6, looking at verse 1, Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, he has lived, he has fallen, and he has gone away from the Lord, and is caught in sin and is caught in evil and is caught in transgression if a man be overtaken in a fault we which are spiritual you're still standing and you're still having the grace of god keeping you faithful unto the lord ye which are spiritual to restore such and one in the spirit of meekness considering thyself lest thou also be tempted. Look at number three there. Number three is the declared promises of full boundlessness. The promises of God are available for us. It's available for every sinner to repent. And when he repents, God has given the promise he will save, he will forgive. The promise of God is there for the believer. The promise of sanctification that will write his word upon our heart. The promise of God is there for the sanctified. It will baptize us in the Holy Ghost. The promise of God is there for every member of the body of Christ, every child of God, every need that God himself will grant us life and grant us life more abundantly. And look at now Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 39. It says for the promise is unto you. Is it promise of salvation? The promise is unto you. Is it the promise of righteousness? The promise is unto you. Is it the promise of healing? The promise is unto you. Is it the promise of deliverance? The promise is unto you. Is is it the promise of writing his word upon our heart? The promise is unto you. Is it the promise of the better covenant? The promise is unto you. Is it the promise of the gift of the Holy Ghost, the baptism and the immersion and the power and the enveloping of the Holy Ghost? The promise is unto you. Is it the promise of strength that the Lord will keep you in his power, in his strength, and no evil will overcome you? You, the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off even as many as the Lord our God shall call and whatever promise you are claiming today and you are standing on praying ground and you are praying with the conditions fulfilled and you turn from anything and everything that will hinder your prayer and then you pray according to the expectation of God the Lord will answer your prayer He'll fulfill the promises in your life in Jesus' name. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, for all the promises of God, all the promises of God, check up those promises from Genesis to Exodus, and then Joshua, and then we have some of the promises in the book of Ruth, and then Esther and Nehemiah, all the promises of God, you can get them in the Psalms and the Proverbs, 
Psalms. You can get them in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. You can get them to the end of the Old Testament and then the promises from Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. All those promises in the epistles, all the promises up to Revelation for all the promises of God in him while you remain in him abide in him yeah yeah and in him amen unto the glory of god by us god will have glory in your life he'll be exalted through your life and as you come to the lord and you claim and stand upon the promises you climb a higher level I said you'll climb a higher level and the great things of God, provision of God will be abundant in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. In 2 Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 3, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, according as his divine power, he has given unto us all things. We shouldn't lack anything, anything spiritual anything personal anything professional anything natural anything in a family you shouldn't lack anything anything for the ministry anything for the work we're doing any power we need any wisdom we need for evangelism and for edifying the body of christ we shouldn't lack anything because according as his divine power he has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue he called you to glory there'll be glory in your life there'll be glory in your family there'll be glory in your ministry administration in jesus name and virtue there'll be no vice in your life there'll be no vanity in your life all those things that will degrade you and spoil your name, the Lord wipe away from your life in Jesus' name. He called us to glory and to virtue. Look at verse 4. He says in verse 4, whereby are given unto us, and we can go to him and claim, and go to him and receive, are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature partakers of the divine nature partakers of the divine nature somebody say amen. amen the other time i you know told you there are people when they pray they concentrate their prayer on satan uh, they, they talk to god for one minute and then they switch over they say satan uh, inside them uh, demon inside them leave me alone but you have a divine nature if you're a child of god say i have a divine nature and the lion, and the, and the lion, that's the running lion, and the lion of the tribe of Judah will not stay in the same heart. They will not be a problem to you in Jesus' name. Strangers or whatever, or wasters or demons or whatever, they will not have the final say in your life in Jesus' name. Calvary conquered them. Calvary destroyed them and you have Christ living in you as the hope of glory and all those things of the nature of Adam, of the nature of Satan, of the nature of the evil one and the powers of darkness will not have any sway, will not have any hold upon any of your lives in Jesus name because we're given he has given to, to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these things ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped your escape you have escaped already having escaped the corruption that is in the world through laws the corrupter will not have a hold in your life the corruptors will not have a hold in our church. We escape the corruption that is in the world through laws. And when you believe, the promise will be fulfilled. 
all you believe that promise will be fulfilled everything you hold on to as you come to God and you're holding on to the promises of God they'll be fulfilled in your life in Jesus name in Romans chapter 4 I'm reading from verse 20 Romans chapter 4 verse 20 is staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief when we come to God if we're going to pray the prayer of faith we look at the promise of God I would not say that's too good to be true that's too great to be true that's so broad to be true you so believe that promise of God and he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief but he was strong in faith giving glory to God in verse 21 it says I'm being fully persuaded you're fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform there'll be a performance in your life there's a performance in my life. I said there's a performance in my life. Be fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And then we're told in verse 22, it says, Therefore it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Verse 23, it says, Now it was not written for his sake alone, that it was imputed for him. But look at this in verse 24, it says, But for us also, for me also, for me also, for us also, to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, in verse 25 it says, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification for our deliverance, for our sanctification, and for our fulfillment. And he has raised up him again for our redemption, total redemption. Everything is now available. And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be delivered, shall be sanctified, shall be filled, shall be baptized, shall be blessed. Whatever promise we're claiming from the promise of God, it is yours today. It is done. I said it is done. You will not go back empty handed in Jesus name. I, I will not go back empty handed. Be that fulfilled in your life in Jesus name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. The irresistible power of the prayer of faith irresistible irresistible come to god come to god and pray hold on to the promises don't stagger do not stagger at any of the promises of god they are yours god will fulfill them